When Australia has to, oh, fuck, no, I don't like that. Sorry, I'll just take that one away. Um, when Australia has done and continues to do a huge amount of harm to the developing world, we have an obligation to help them in the most effective way possible, even if that means a trade off on our economy. We're going to prove to you that this is just the most effective way to help the biggest group of people who are likely the least privileged in this debate. We're going to bring you three pieces of argument. The first is about principle, the second is about why this actually increases political will at best, and it's symmetric at worst. And finally, on why the economic ramifications are a worthwhile trade-off. But firstly, I'm going to bring you three pieces of setup. The first is explaining what the point system actually looks like. We would note the fact that things like uh, employment qualifications, it's things like your language status, your age, and your wealth, which means it does tend to skew to people who are younger and more qualified, university educated, and speak English. That means that the majority of people who apply for these visas are in the developing world, but the majority that actually receive these visas are more likely to skew to be from the developed world. Secondly, how does the lottery system work? Obviously, it is just randomly allocated. But we would note the fact that we still have things like work visas on our side. All right, let's talk about principle. Two, actually, three parts of this principle. Firstly, I'm going to explain why Australia has the obligation to do this. Secondly, I'm going to explain how we benefit people that come here. And finally, I'm going to explain why it is critical to developing countries and how we benefit them. Firstly, on why Australia has the obligation to, one, developing nations, but two, neighbouring countries that they have hurt and often continue to hurt in the present, particularly through things like environmental degradation. And there are four reasons why they have the obligation. One, denying refugees in the status quo by really harsh restrictions on borders means that often people who should be seeking humanitarian refugee status actually have to go through the regular visa system and it always fails them because they never are able to meet the point system. Second of all, we've caused huge economic harms in these countries. We'd note things that that's caused a huge amount of uh, overcrowding but also just economic collapse in these places. And that is because we've directly caused a huge amount of brain drain from skilled work from skilled workforces. That's because Australia, one, is able to pay them much more, so it's extremely lucrative to come here. But second of all, the quality of living that we're able to offer them is often like absolutely leaps and bounds higher than they would experience in their home nation. We would note the fact that this looks like taking a huge amount of teachers from the Pacific Islands to the point where their education levels have been decimated by the fact that we've drained them in that way. It looks like things like taking administration staff from Indonesia, so now their companies aren't able to function successfully. That has caused a huge amount of issues problems in those areas. But finally, we'd point to the fact that colonialisation obviously exists, and this is just one way that we can continue to repair for it. So, this makes these two next arguments I'm going to bring you under the principle the most important in this debate. And the first one is how we're able to benefit the people that come here, and that's for a few reasons. Firstly, though, I'm going to explain this changes the people who are accepted, because as I've just explained, the people that are currently accepted under the status quo are those who are English, those who have high levels of credit, um, accreditation, not that those levels of accreditation are quite expensive to receive, so that just means empirically that they're more likely to be wealthy and more likely to be privileged. And even if the people that get accepted in the status quo are from developing countries, they're likely to be the most privileged of that group. So even if they are less privileged in the developed countries, they are still privileged somewhat. So why do we think we develop, why do we think we benefit these people for a few reasons? Noting the fact that, first, we think the capacity to support low-skilled workers in Australia is just quite high. That's because we have the infrastructure to outskill people. We'd point to our hugely successful welfare program. We'd point to things like universal healthcare. We'd point to things like education being relatively easy to attain, particularly things like language courses and TAFE, which are often free if you receive a visa. Secondly, we'd point to things like employment. Things like our tourism industry is one booming, which means that getting jobs in hospitality and service and retail are relatively accessible in the status quo. But second of all, we'd point to the fact that we do have quite a large mining and mineral industry, which means we're able to offer these people like flying fly out jobs, also things like truck driving that are relatively low skilled, therefore are relatively accessible to the kinds of people that we would be accepting under our side, also things like agriculture. Finally though, we actually not finally, thirdly, we're able to offer them a great, good quality of living. We know the fact that we just have a huge land mass available, like rural towns that are just being developed now, regional areas that are being developed, that they can go and live for relatively low cost. Finally though, why do we think that these people would successfully integrate? We note one, we have the diaspora to support them, particularly in regional areas and areas outside of the CBD. We point to like Western and Southern Sydney, where you're able to receive the kind of support that you need. That's things like specialised education and language. It's things like having religious institutions. It's things like having lower levels of stigma because that is more normalised in those areas. So even if, but the, even the last thing here is, even if there's a, like a higher amount of stigma on our side, that is a trade-off that we're willing to make because we think this principle is more important. 
Third part of the principle, why do we think it's critical to developing countries? Four things. Firstly, it obviously reduces the brain drain. And just note the volume of impact here, because one teacher leaving a rural community in a developing country just has such a disproportionate impact than that teacher coming to Australia does. So by just that reason, it is incredibly critical to be able to retain some of those skilled workers in developing countries. Second of all, they're able to do things like provide remittances, like send money to their family. Thirdly, the exchange rate means that they're able to be extremely well, like well off in proportion. And finally, things like high wages just means that they receive quite a good level of support. Next, let's talk about political will and why we're able to increase it, increase it on site affirmative. The first claim to make here is that there's no longer a perception that these people are taking jobs away from locals, particularly we note like the middle class, kind of those administrative, like accounting style jobs are no longer being taken away or are at least being taken away to a lower extent. So that means the extent to which the right is able to capitalise arguments about they're taking jobs from us, they're taking employment opportunities, they mean that we don't have any money, are far less. Secondly, but then they're more sympathetic actors by virtue of the fact they're more likely to be poor and they're more likely to go on to go through a huge amount of suffering. The government can market that in a way that such will be more palatable to people. But finally, we think that even if the political will is slightly decreased, we think it's relatively marginal given the fact that there is already an anti-immigration sentiment and we think the extent to which this furthers it is extremely small. Finally, let's talk about economic ramifications because I think that the first thing to point out here is that like, we would point to the example that Eugene's told me about, which is like random lotteries with the Pacific Island nations, and note the fact that that has been incredibly successful and has had really high levels of retention and economic support. And that's something we think we can point to that this program would similarly look like. But I think we can just outweigh these economic arguments twofold. The first is that Australia is just an incredibly wealthy country. And note the fact that that wealth is probably only going to increase. We'd point to things like the abundance of rare minerals which we have, which are translating into economic growth relatively quickly. That means that we have a huge amount of economic capital. But second of all, we think that a lot of our wealth that we've accumulated as a nation has just come at the expense of these developing countries and we think this is just one form of repayment. So obviously side negative is going to bring you a case about the economic harms that this does and the fact that these people are going to be more reliant on the welfare system. But it is critical to remember that Australia has an abundance of privilege and at the point where it has that privilege we ought to owe it to these people to do it in a way that is the most utilitarian and doing it by the random lottery is obviously the way to fulfill that. We're able to meaningfully improve these people's lives, we're able to pay them wages they otherwise never would get, we're able to establish them long term being in the country, they don't have incentives to leave and that's why affirmative must win this debate. So one piece of setup, two pieces of rebuttal, three arguments. To start with setup, the only thing I want to note is that this is clearly not a debate about refugees. The treaty of non refoulement still exists. It's very rare for refugees to enter into the migrant system, and it would be even rarer for one of these refugees who make up a tiny proportion of like the billion people who might rather live in Australia would actually get selected. So this is very rarely going to be a debate about refugees. This is overwhelmingly a debate about economic migrants, the ability of us to provide good economic opportunities to these people and actually make sure they gain something from migration is clearly more important than general obligations this team describes. Two pieces of rebuttal. Firstly, on the obligation, uh, clearly they don't discharge this obligation by default. They take a random set of people, which will include some French people, some British people, whatever, kind of, you know, people that kind of poo-poo. Some of them will definitely get selected, meaning this principle is clearly contingent. It falls out, but for the other issues in the debate. Secondly, on brain drain, four responses. Firstly, this is either marginal or a concession. Australia alone does not take enough migrants to meaningfully destroy the economies of a huge number of different countries. Notably, we accept refugees from a wide range of countries, unclear how we brain drain each and every one of them enough to really make a difference. Or they concede we take plenty of people in and give them opportunities. Sounds like a benefit we can trade off against. But secondly, uh, we are often not taking the most brain draining professions. Two of the jobs, for example, that we prioritize on the list of skilled migrants are nurses and fruit laborers. I'm clear that's a substantial brain drain, which is taking laborers who clearly don't have opportunities where they live and bringing them to a country where they do have more opportunities. Thirdly, many of the countries we accept migrants from have a surplus of skilled workers. It is very common, for instance, for people who are qualified as doctors in India to be driving taxis for the reason that their education system is actually fairly robust, but there are a few people who can afford to pay for a doctor. It's very hard to get employed as a doctor. There are plenty of scenarios where people you know, like, like the most common scenario when someone leaves a country despite being fairly qualified is if they're not being used, we don't brain drain. Finally, we point out that there are a number of remittance-based economies. They highlight this and its benefit. Like the Philippines intentionally skills up a huge surplus of nurses, many of whom will move to the US or Australia and send money back. Seems like a great benefit. They're going to make more in Australia or the US than they would in the Philippines. Knocks out a bunch of their material. Obviously, a bunch of my arguments will also be responsive. First argument, why do we help migrants the most? The first thing I want to note here is to go over some of the reasons why, uh, the reasons that 
that we select certain people and why that's likely to mean that these people will have a better time once they get to Australia. The first thing is you select yourself like existing family in Australia. It's obviously pretty handy to have a support network, people who know the culture, know the systems, can help you get your footing before you know you kind of make it on your own. Secondly, we select for stuff like skills. Uh, this is so that you can have a job and make money. It's expensive to live in Australia. It's important to make sure these people aren't just destitute. They can also sponsor further migration from their home country should they want to with that job. They can support dependents with that job. Skills are important. And I'm not here, we're not just using skills as like, you know, a corollary for privilege. Sure, some of the skills we select for are doctors or IT workers, but also as I flagged in my introduction, plenty of the skills we need are nurses, are farm laborers, are, as they point out, miners. These people aren't particularly privileged, but they're still skills that we need in Australia. There are shortages in those skills. That's the reason you know that we select for those skills as well. And finally, we select for things like language. That's important because it prevents you from being exploited as easily. You can interface with government, police, you know your rights more readily. This is an important thing we should select for. Compare this to the plan the opposition gives you for migrants once they arrive in Australia. They say like FIFO jobs, like the most desirable mining jobs, will suddenly be handed over to a bunch of migrants. They say, well, we can educate these people and train them up, not explaining how they access this education system, whether they speak English to learn within this education system, or how exactly any of that education translates to a job in, in a context where these people haven't previously had any experience or previously have any reason to think they'll succeed very much in Australia. And on top of that, I would note, there's actually a substantial risk of exploitation for migrants when we don't select along the criteria that we do. That's because of how migration is pitched to a huge number of people. It's done by third parties and agencies. They take a fee, they try to promise a job, but then they put you in a sweatshop. These sorts of issues are important. And for every migrant that arrives in Australia and is put in that scenario, and we explain it's a fair amount because it's pretty hard to apply for a visa if you're that underprivileged uh, you know, in, in any other way. They don't just lose out on a benefit, they incur an act of harm. That every, for every migrant that suffers that situation, they clearly lose points on the board. How, you should weigh, how should you weigh this argument? Firstly, whether or not you believe our exploitation stuff, we clearly do more good per migrant, which is a net good on our side, because when those migrants get here, they flourish. But I also point out that migrants give up a lot when they come to Australia. They miss out on connection with their family, with their culture, with their religion. Meaning you have some reason to think they actually need to flourish in Australia in order for us to confidently say we're actually helping people when they arrive here. Which is a reason to weigh all of our selection criteria extremely highly because it explains to you that the people we bring to Australia are more likely to benefit than, than the people the opposition brings. Second argument in this speech will explain why the current system is good for Australia itself. Uh, the reasons are fairly simple. We obviously select complementary skills to our economy. We fill shortages. Uh, we select people where there's less money input upfront required per migrant. And that's important for two reasons. Firstly, obviously, Australia isn't just comprised of like rich, horrible, racist people. There are plenty of people in Australia who could use a nurse to staff their local hospital, who could use additional teachers or could use additional laborers to make goods and services more accessible. Just because these people live in Australia doesn't mean we should discount them. Maybe you think this argument isn't as important as the others, but should everything else end up in a deadlock, this provides a clear win for side negative. The final argument I'm going to cover in this speech is why we accept far more migrants than the opposition. So even if you care about privilege, even if you aren't convinced that we don't select actively many people who are underprivileged, this explains why we're still going to, on net, get more of those people than literally rolling the dice. Uh, I would point as a beginning note to the empirical evidence that Australia and Canada have year on year increased the number of migrants they take in as a proportion of their population and they use the selection system. Whereas lottery countries like the US and UK have seen a steady decline. But on top of that we can explain why this is the case. That's because the primary barrier to accepting migrants is xenophobia, the perception it's a drain on your country, that you're doing someone a favour, they're going to steal your job. And specifically in the low skill jobs that these guys say will be the only places where migrants end up, Really weird for them to suggest that us bringing in accountants and doctors and stuff will bring up this like anti-migrant furor for people who generally aren't competing for those jobs. That's just like the way the kind of political spectrum sucks up. But secondly, we would also dismiss the political uh, uh, like viability of. Uh, secondly, though, we would dismiss the political viability of operating a system. Uh, oh, so, sorry. Secondly, we would also explain that our side increases the political viability of the immigrant system overall in the long run. That is, if you bring in migrants who perform well in Australia and have good medium run performance, 
That is the strongest evidence over any political theory that explains to you why xenophobia decreases in the long run. And we would note that benefit can translate to a number of other ways to succeed. That is, if for whatever reason we do need to implement a stronger refugee policy specifically, it's much easier to do that if the overall issue of immigration is one which isn't shrouded in the same degree of xenophobia. If we can point to a long track record of people coming to Australia, enhancing its culture, enhancing its economy, enhancing goods and services, much easier to do any of the other good stuff this team supports. But finally, we would also point out this stops taking away some of the specific forms of racist rhetoric which are the most pervasive. Stuff like asking, well, we don't know who these people are. These people could be criminals. Like, this team literally rolls the dice with those people and they can explain to their blue in the face that, oh, we'll still do all the security back checks. But that's not what matters to a xenophobe. A selection system is what dispels those myths. That, that's what makes the difference. This argument is important for two reasons. Firstly, if you believe either of our first two arguments, we scale those arguments up by also bringing in more migrants. But secondly, it seems to cut to the core of what this team, this team is trying to say. They want to make this debate about vulnerability and really support a lottery in dealing with it. We explain to you that we provide the political impetus in this argument to bring in more migrants, to help more people, and for those reasons, we're proud to oppose. <laughs> Confusingly, I don't think Dan listened to our model. As we explained, this is a general admission pathway for immigrants, not about work visas. And like every other country that has a random lottery for immigrants, they can simultaneously have specific work visas for a set of shortages that occur within their country. I don't understand why so much of the time is spent on it, particularly because it seemed really concessionary. Like, why do you have work visas in the first place if they're so politically toxic? Like, why do you have the type of work visas in the first place if you think those individuals are going to be exploited and you're going to suffer? It seems like you're arguing a lot of the material that actually we would like to deliver in this case. I'm going to make four arguments. The first is, and the most important question that we answer, simply why we prevent a set of double harms that we think is the most important thing in this debate. Because we first explained that this significantly perpetuates a severe brain drain in a number of countries. For instance, Myanmar, for instance, the Philippines, for instance, a series of Pacific islands. Their responses are broadly threefold. The first is, it's not enough people to significantly harm these communities, which firstly, it didn't respond to actually a preemptive analysis on this. That is, it is neighboring countries that are the most likely to do this because of the perceived closeness and less distance to their family and greater cultural familiarity and affiliations. But it's also a series of English-speaking countries that disproportionately get taken from by the very skill requirements that English-speaking is one of them. But lastly, that only a single teacher or a single nurse from these communities yields enormous sets of harms to them. Like, they say it's not enough to significantly harm these countries, but we just don't think that's true. When a community is deprived of one of their two doctors that has severely impairs their capacity to genuinely treat individuals with chronic illnesses in that community, I don't think this, I think this is too flippant. But second, they say, ah, oh, actually a lot of these, uh, uh, what is this? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, they say, ah, oh, look, there's an, actually an oversupply of skilled individuals within these sets of countries, so this is actually correcting for that set of problem. I think they are cherry packing a set of examples here of a very rare instance, but they also don't, I think, need to respond to the analysis about whether that actual qualification is then credited or not. So I'm deeply unsure that under their side they fix that problem, but I just think it is in the absolute minority of instances where it does occur. And why do I think that this argument alone actually then just wins the debate? Uh, the reasons are twofold. The first is, is because the amount <coughs> The harm it does to these local communities that are incredibly vulnerable is so severe. It's when you take the essential skilled labour out of that country that companies really struggle to form in those local communities because they lack the skills and technical expertise to be able to find enough people to work at those manufacturing jobs. But critically perhaps, because it actually takes a huge amount of the wealth out of those countries. It's when the people that typically could access higher form of education leave to Australia that they take with them an enormous amount of their wealth alongside them. And that money otherwise would have been spent reinvesting in the local community, buying sets of services, actually prompting forms of reinvestment, and that money otherwise is taken to a developed nation that really needs it a very small amount. But the second reason is, is simply because we actually think it perpetuates a series of oppression of refugees. And Dan's response to this, I think, misses the argument. The argument is, 
that Australia has historically failed to fulfill its humanitarian obligation to the world, and it has economically benefited from the fact that it's taken on less refugees and taken on less disadvantaged people more generally. And we think it is important that Australia corrects that wrong, begins to actually set up an immigration system that disproportionately caters towards developing nations to be able to be far more humanitarian on that front. And again, it's a lot of the same or similar countries that are affected, places like East Timor, that disproportionately do have English-speaking individuals that are the ones that would have loved to come to Australia Australia the most, but were denied under a moral regime. We think of the only side that corrects that historic injustice. Why do we think it wins off this alone? The first is because we think Australia has a direct moral obligation to these countries. This directly caused a series of poverty and harms that meant those individuals want to immigrate out of those countries. It owes it to those people to accept them. But secondly, because it has enormously benefited from that set of suffering and it ought to repay for those benefits. It is when there are less companies being able to effectively set up in Indonesia to compete with Australian companies of that brain drain, we think Australia has benefited and it should repay. But second is you don't even need to believe that. All you need to believe in this debate is that we get more immigrants from the developing world and that benefits <coughs> individuals who are the most vulnerable is the most significant. They say, ah, but uh, uh, actually our first big argument here is look, the percentage of immigrants all of your total immigration pool is more likely to be from developing nations. And I think this is not an argument they directly seek to respond to. They seek to undercut it in two different ways. The first way is they argue that they get more remittances from a series of wealthier but fewer individuals that arrive on the Australian shores. Unfortunately for them, we've actually already preempted this argument at first by explaining that the limitation to remittances is not the wage in Australia or the amount of money. Because even $100 that you sent in AUD to these developing nations could transform a child life because of incredibly high exchange rates and also because of incredibly high wages in Australia, which means the more significant factor is the number of people that access that remittance in the first place. It benefits more communities, benefits more different individuals that now access greater forms of mobility. And their second response to their better response is, there's a lack of political will for immigrants here. What this means is that we get less total immigrants in the first place. They make two broad arguments. The first argument is that low-skill immigrants have some of the greatest anti-migrant uh, kind of rhetoric, and this is therefore going to be politically quite toxic. Unfortunately, I just don't understand why they're trying to persuade a bunch of xenophobes. I think our characterization is much more plausible about why we gain a greater amount of political acceptance. Because who we're targeting is a set of middle class individuals that are actually politically quite powerful. They do a lot of direct funding to political parties. They tend to have a great form of media platform and enfranchisement. They're much more politically active because they are wealthier and a bit more stable. And there are a set of middle class individuals that see skilled immigrants as directly attacking their job. What they describe of a bunch of people in the Rust Belt in America, a bunch of people that are just blaming immigrants for their lost jobs, yeah? There's nothing rational about that and it's purely xenophobic. I don't understand how we can change the minds of those people in the slightest. Whereas us are trying to attack an individual who is relatively rational and is actually losing their job or facing great competition in that space. But last, I just think the political will question is so marginal. Like, the change in this debate is whether we do it by lottery and it's fully random, or whether we solely take it from skilled immigration. I think the vast majority of people just ask the question, do I want more immigrants or not, or less immigrants? And aren't too fussed about specifically the education levels or the wealth of the immigrants that come to the country in the first place. So I think it's more significant mechanism here is that we cut a greater percentage of the immigration pool, which is currently totally dominated by developed nations, which access that ling uh, in English barrier, that access that employment, that are more likely to have accredited educations, that are more likely to pass wealth checks, means that we actually get it to the pin people that need it the most in this debate. The next question is how much they help them. Side opposition makes three broad pushes. The first is that they're less likely to find employment, which firstly falls foul to the problem that we still have work visas, but secondly, I think, is a little bit silly. Like, their argument is that they're specialised fruit pickers and expert truck drivers. Uh, these are highly transferable roles. It means that we don't need a specific work visa for those types of individuals, right? So, when you have a random lottery, they can fill any of those sets of jobs in society that are facing demand. But second, is they say, ah, oh, there's greater exploitation. And here the problem is, is that they support work visas where the greatest amount of exploitation occurs. Because your visa is directly tied to your employment, you can't access another job if you're on a work visa for a fruit 
fruit picking plantation, right? Whereas under your side, you have that flexibility, you have that choice, you can escape that exploitation because you are not tied in the same way. That last pushes on language, which is true to some extent, but I think significantly mitigated by the fact that we explain there are extensive diaspora that provide these education services in dual languages, that our education facilities and infrastructure in Australia are world class and fully capable of providing to these individuals. And yes, we're willing to support them with degrees of welfare in the short term to help them get that language to be productive citizens. We don't think this is a significant harm. We think we owe a moral obligation to these people. That's why we have to propose. <laughs> The first thing I'm going to do is just explain how either system works and who they let in. The claim that we hear from this negative team, or affirmative team rather, is that point systems track privilege. And this firstly is untrue. The point system as it exists in Australia selects for things like skill gaps or labour shortages in Australia's economy, which doesn't necessarily track people with the most education. It selects for people with family ties or people with language proficiency, which doesn't necessarily mean you are the most wealthy or the most well educated. We need people in, for instance, nursing and agriculture. Those are not particularly privileged professions in many contexts. These guys respond by saying, well, we can also have work visas, or, you know, that's a separate thing. Like, I think that is a concession which is narrowing the debate, but clearly work visas are different from immigration. The second thing, though, is that even if you believe that people who enter via a point system are more privileged, that is unimportant. And the reason for that is because most migrants to Australia are economic, they are definitionally not refugees. So, litigating the relative privilege of those people is not very useful for this affirmative team because the conditions of 95% of prospective migrants is, yes, sometimes bad, but is very rarely horrific. And you must compare that then to the conditions in Australia, which we prove to very little response will very often be worse. And I know that the most vulnerable migrants who they most want to let in are the people who are most likely to be exploited in Australia and for whom the trade-off of deciding to leave behind families they know, cultures that are familiar to them, jobs they might already have in their country actually probably wouldn't be worth it. And note that these guys don't prove that people make the choice rationally to come to Australia. Often, as we say before, the way that immigration systems are done or the way that people come to other countries is pretty exploitative. It's marketed as a dream of a better life that you could come to in the rich nation of Australia. It's done through a third party who takes a fee. It's very unclear that uprooting your whole life is worth it when you're far more likely to be subject to things like exploitation, when you can't speak the language well, when you don't have family here, when you don't have skills that will get you a job. And we have no direct response to this other than well, visa holders are hurt too who is more likely to be hurt a migrant who's stuck here then without the language skills or the job skills with which to protect themselves so this is incredibly important because i think the premise that these people are incredibly disprivileged and they would be better off in australia is basically at the core of the affirmative team's case it underlines their material about brain drain and is contradicted later it is the reason their principle stands up we say many of these people are economic migrants they are not as vulnerable as they suggest their benefits fall down. They're people who Australia needs are the people who are let in under a point system. They're people who would live a good life here. That does not necessarily mean they're the richest or the most privileged. Secondly then, what is life like in Australia for these migrants? The first thing I want to note about their analysis is that many of the reasons they give are symmetric, right? They're like, well, you have diasporic communities. We have some integration programs. At the very best, those are symmetric, though those clearly work for us better because we select the people who have family here already because it is less financially burdensome on the state to provide integration or language programs when people can already speak the language. And second, many of the reasons are inapplicable, that is they apply to skilled migrants. For instance, talking about fly-in, fly-out jobs that you might need on mining sites, which usually require university degrees. The slightly better analysis is to say, well, Australia has some resources to give low-skilled workers a good life, like you have TAFE and some jobs available, but this is obviously all mitigation, and it all applies vastly more to skilled migrants, or even if not to skilled migrants, rather, the migrants who the point system decides are useful for Australia's economy in the moment. It is obviously easier to get jobs when you're coming into a labour market that requires the skills that you have. It is obviously easier to be integrated, to access doctors, to access people who you need, to access housing when you can speak the language that allows you to navigate the bureaucracy in the city in which you are in. You don't need the kind of welfare which they say exists minimally, but really don't ever prove would exist in this system. And I would note, contrast the empirical examples of Australia and Canada, which have point systems in which migrants are treated relatively well, to the US and UK, where migrants are treated awfully because of the lack of political capital and simply because it places a substantially greater financial burden on the state to provide those resources which 
these team guys absolutely never prove. The final last stitch attempt from these guys is to sort of try and flip the material on stigma and racism, which I would note applies beneficially for the negative team in two respects. Firstly, it means that life for migrants here is much better because they're much less likely to be subject to things like hate crimes. And secondly, all of Daniel's incredibly important material, which gets insufficient response, about why this just increases the volume of migration we get overall because people are more happy with having them in. What are their responses? The first thing they say is it's marginal because people will still be racist. That is insufficient because we prove the very specific reasons why people are racist against migrants basically evaporate on our side. People are racist, but we say, hang on, these migrants are like you. They have jobs that are useful to you. People don't like migrants because they believe they're undeserving. We say, no, they are deserving because they met all these points criteria because they can contribute to the economy. People don't migra like migrants because they're a drain on resources. Now we say, no, they're actively contributing to the economy and they require less money in terms of welfare. We solve those problems. I would note that many people do in fact want workers, they do want a doctor in their community if they don't have one already, so they have some reason to like migrants on our side, right? But on their side, you give them the racism that allows them to push that away, or the other narratives which allow them to push that away. So the second thing they say is, well, it seems like they're suffering more because they're poor, which is a ridiculous argument that assumes, one, sympathy for the poor, and two, that people don't see these migrants as responsible for their own poverty, which is often the, the narrative that is very easily spun in systems that the affirmative team supports. So, clearly life for migrants is better and we get more migrants. Second thing I'll talk about is benefits for Australia. The affirmative's only response is mitigation. They're like, we're rich anyway, and we got our wealth illegitimately. But I would note, firstly, as we point out, not all Australians are rich. It's still very good to have doctors in communities in rural areas that do not have doctors. Secondly, I would note a responsive principle, and I'll get to their principle in a moment, which is that states do have some degree of right to control their own borders. Of course, that's not absolute, but I think the state is a very important form of social organization that is at least subjectively very meaningful to people. It's Australia's revealed preference to have a point system and it benefits Australia. Yes, we need to weigh that against the interests of migrants, of course, but it's reasonable that that is a calculation. But finally, I know that the fact that this benefits Australia means that we can help migrants more into the future because we are A, richer and B, less anxious about our economic prospects, which means things like racist popular po populist policy is less likely to get grounding. What are their two attempts here to come around this wealth of material? The first thing they say is there's a principle Australia has an obligation because we played some role in the causes of misery in the developing world and surrounding nations. Firstly, this relies on points tracking privilege, which and because we were brought, brought provide migration to. So the privilege stuff is their only principal differentiator, which I've already rebutted. Secondly, note just how imprecisely this argument is proven. They say we cause the suffering of poor people. They don't connect that to migration. We can rectify that through, for instance, greater budgets for foreign aid, which I note is way easier on our side for three reasons. Firstly, because you have more political capital for it, because people aren't resentful for the migrants entering their country. Secondly, because the economy is better overall, because we're actually able to match skill shortages, so you have more money in the budget to allocate. And thirdly, because we provide direct remittance to those countries, which is a form of informal or foreign aid that is very useful. Thirdly, I just note this is contingent on the practical section of the debate. And fourthly, it is in tension with their brain drain material. If we are bringing in the most disprivileged people, it's very unclear why you're draining all the doctors and the teachers from these countries. That is a tension. This principle can only maybe survive if you believe that some migrants are refugees who have to go through this system. This is A, unproven, and B, obviously untrue. It is not in your interest as a refugee to go through the migration system because you are far more likely to get in as a refugee because all those things are more lenient, but I don't miss you, we give you a Daniel, that we're more able to support refugees now because we have that political capital. The final last attempt then is on brain drain. Um, the first thing I note is this is not a harm. If you believe that Australia is really awesome and lots of people want to come here for a better life, it is principally abhorrent to deny them that. The more you believe the brain drain argument, the more you must credit our arguments. Secondly, all of Dan's material about a surplus of skilled workers, about remittance-based economies, which is contested and then conceded, I note. But additionally, I note that many people we're getting in are not doctors or teachers. They're, again, people who are agricultural workers or who have family ties. Secondly, why don't getting rid of fruit pickers, even if you disbelieve that, is also bad for the agricultural economies of the countries they take people from. But thirdly, countries prone to this sort of uh, uh, to this sort of brain drain design remittance-based systems to deal with it. Absolutely, this is a win for side negative. questions in this speech. The first one is what obligation we have as a privileged country. The second is the impact that we have on the immigrants themselves. And the third is the impact on our own country. Let's start with the first and the obligation that we have. There are a few claims that we hear from side negative. 
first is a response to our stuff on brain drain. The second is that we can't actually ensure we get the least privileged people by virtue of the fact that it's a lottery. And the final stuff is about the fact that we're not talking about refugees in this instance and that we should have control over our own borders and value sovereignty. I'm going to start with the stuff about how this is a random set of people, which means that we're not necessarily getting the most disprivileged. The first observation I would make is that this problem, the problem with the point system is that even if you don't, like, sorry, the problem with this is that it's currently selected in a way that is pernicious. It is entirely self-interested. So on the principle levels, you are doing it in a way that is inherently favouring a certain <coughs> group of people. So even if those people are not the most privileged, and we would argue a lot of the time bath group because they are at least somewhat more privileged, you are doing it in a way that seems self-interested because it is self-interested. The next thing is, we should obviously principally take a utilitarian approach because now you have some chance of being selected as a randomly low-skilled person as opposed to no chance of being selected because obviously under their world you are not you were directed because you are not good enough. Under our world you were directed because it is arbitrary. Obviously it is better to be rejected because it's arbitrary rather than be rejected because you're not good enough. Thirdly though, in terms of refugees, because Sophie is like, oh well, these are all economic migrants, we're not talking about refugees in this debate. And no, that wasn't our claim. Our claim is that people who should have gotten refugee status often seek to apply through these methods of, re of visas because they have been disqualified previously. So, it means that people who we principally owe the refugee status to, but have never done, apply through this system. And with the point system, they have zero chance of getting in, but with our system, at least they have some chance of getting in. Thirdly, let's talk about why people are actually rational when they opt to moving to Australia. Because Sophie is like, well, these people trade off a lot to get here and it's not worth it if you end up getting no benefits when you move to this country. Firstly, I think it's just untrue you get no benefits, that's like a crazy claim. But let's actually explain why these people are rational. First of all, this is obviously a huge decision and at the point where you've put in a huge amount of work to this visa application, where you've done all of the things to be able to get the points or not get the points, that is something that you're obviously cognizant of. Second of all though, people have to make decisions that are difficult all the time. We know things like taking a job that is particularly difficult or doing things like dangerous travel are also things that are, you know, we could argue are irrational. But people themselves know their own preferences and these people have a revealed preference to come to Australia and that in their mind that is clearly a trade-off and that is something that we should allow them to trade off even if it is perhaps uh, you know, not worth it, but I'm going to prove to you later on why it is worth it. Finally, Sophie's like, well, we should have control over our own borders at least to some extent. Firstly, we think we have control over borders to the extent where we need people to fill skills shortages. We point to the fact that we still have work visas. But second of all, we obviously are still controlling the number of refugees that are, sorry, the number of immigrants that are entering our country. So even if we're not controlling the type of immigrants that they are, we still have control over the numbers. And we think that the numbers is probably the most important type of control when it comes to sovereignty. But thirdly, this is obviously a trade-off we're willing to make. Yes, we get less control on our side, but we've explained to you numerous times that the type of country Australia is means that we owe a significant amount of people this status and we're never able to give them when the point system exists. Finally though in this issue, let's talk about the idea of brain drain because they're like, oh well, we don't actually take enough workers from these places to be able to claim brain drain, but also those places like India often have a surplus of skilled workers. The first thing I'll say, which Eugene also said that we've got no response, is that the proportional impact of the kind of workers that we take from these countries just means that it impacts them far more than it impacts us. We've pointed to places like the Pacific Islands in Indonesia, where we've taken their workers in education and where we've taken their workers in administration, that just have had significant damage particularly on the rural, most uh, economically bad off places within those countries. So we note the fact that that means that education levels are low, it means that levels of technology are low, it means that the efficiency of their businesses is incredibly low, and that just is something that we ought to regret. We've explained to you the best way to account for that is to not take into consideration any sort of skills these people have and do them in an arbitrary fashion. Second of all, let's explain the impacts on migrants and their quality of life. Because they're like, well, it's really hard to receive a job uh, when you're, you don't use the point system because you're not able to allocate people to complementary sectors. But also, you don't know if you speak English. And finally, that you know, nursing and fruit picking are like a good way to get in because you need a lot of those workers. Firstly, point to the fact that these examples are often the most exploitative types of visas. We point to the fact that the fruit picking industry is absolutely fucking shit. It's unclear whether this is a good thing to back. Second of all, we explained that I think it is just quite likely these people would be able to get a job. We've explained to you that areas like our tourism sector and our rare earth mineral sector are booming, which means that there is so much need for those types of low skilled workers to actually fill those jobs. And know the fact that a lot of those jobs actually don't require English language skills at the point where you're not directly operating customer service. But even if you do need English language skills, we explained to you at Eugene at no response that we are actually one of the best countries in the world when it comes to educating people with English language skills by virtue of the fact that we have specific educational institutions that focus on bridging the gap between ESL and EFL people and then English primary language speakers. So that means that our ability to support people is relatively high. 
And even if we can't support people perfectly, we can do a far better job than they otherwise would get off in other countries and in their own country because at least they're able to access some meaningful form of employment. They've clearly traded off the better life in Australia and it is something that is worth it for them. So I just don't think it's true that they're never going to be able to get a job in Australia. And even if it takes them a little bit longer to get a job, obviously we have the obligation to do so as we've explained to you down the bench. Finally, let's talk about the impact on our domestic economy and political will. The first thing to say is, well, the political will of this is very low because there's things like xenophobia. And second of all, the economic uh, impact is bad. Firstly, on the idea of political will. Firstly, as we explained to you, things like xenophobia and racism are going to exist on both sides of the debate. So equally, they're going to be able to weaponize that because it's an irrational thing that they're saying. So both sides is going to be that kind of weaponization. Second of all, though, as we explained to you, the group of people that exist in the middle class are far more powerful, which means that when jobs like accounting and when jobs that require some form of skill are taken, it's easier for those people to work together as a block to uprise against that particular policy. And they're likely to have far more political capital. But the last thing we would say is that places like the UK and the US US did not lose a lot of their jobs because of immigrants. They lost a lot of their jobs because of globalisation. So it's a fallacy to make that link. Clearly people are just irrational in both worlds. We'll always blame immigrants, but the blaming of immigrants is not a reason not to do it. Obviously political will is also always going to be relatively low when it comes to immigration, but that is something we're willing to trade off. But true, we, we still get a relative amount of political will on our side by virtue of the fact that the middle class are far more appeased when it's not their jobs directly that are being taken. Secondly though, on terms of the economy, Sophie's like, well now as a country we have more money because these workers are contributing to our economy in a meaningful way. Firstly, I just think that's a crazy link to make. Having more money does not mean you are able to treat your, ref your, your immigrants better. It's just not clear that that money is directly going to go into helping immigrants. We point to the fact that the USA is incredibly wealthy with that and dealing with it. And that's not because they don't have a point system, it's because they're bad in the country. Economic management is obviously a problem on both sides of the debate. So, the important thing to realise at the end of this bad part of our case is that the impact on immigrants probably is that being able to receive a job is true on both sides, but at least we're able to benefit people who don't have the prerequisite skills and they are more likely to be a less privileged part of society. But second of all, I think it's unfair for a negative team to dismiss all of our principled benefits that we give you. We explain to you that we've been like done terrible amounts of colonialization. We explain to you that we've continued to exploit and drain these countries from their most skilled workers and the disproportionate impact that has on those countries means that we owe the obligation to be utilitarian. Even if we don't get the least privileged, we at least give them an opportunity to come in the first place and that is why we must win this debate. Panel, I'm going to start this speech by addressing side firmness principle. Because it's a rotting strike upon, the rest, upon which the rest of their case rests. And as soon as we kick it out, the whole thing tumbles down. What do they say? They repeatedly tell you that we should trade off economic growth, we should trade off basically everything else for this obligation that we have to assist a variety of people in the third world who we ought to assist via immigration policy. Three responses. The first thing I will contest is that this obligation exists to begin with. A number of responses. They tell you, well, we have an obligation to refugees who often cannot get in through the refugee system and therefore they have to come in through the migration system. We explain firstly that that does make sense because refugees exist parallel to this debate, come in via a separate system, have international law like the Treaty of non refoulement that prevents them from being turned back, and that if you didn't get in through the refugee system, the odds you'd get in through the immigration system are so vanishingly low, it doesn't make sense to believe that this is a part of the debate. The second claim is to say, well, Australia did colonialism, therefore clearly we owe an obligation. One, this is an obligation that extends to like very limited set of countries, considering Australia's colonial efforts have affected not every country in the world, which limits the scope of this principle. And thirdly, the one they really rely on is the idea that we've contributed to a harm of brain drain in other countries. We have eight responses to this claim. The first one is just to say it's unclear brain drain is a harm. As we tell you down the bench, it sounds like we've assisted a lot of people by allowing them the opportunity to move here. Secondly, we point out that this effect is very likely to have been limited because the number of people who can come to Australia is obviously sufficiently small that it's unclear we've drained the economies of the 195 other countries in the world. Thirdly, we point out that in the vast majority of contexts where we do take professionals, there was a surplus of those individuals to begin with, and in fact, they were not able to use their skills. Why? All you have to do is go to Delhi to see plenty of PhDs and doctors just driving cabs because there were no jobs for them in those particular contexts. It was very good if they could come and use their skills in Australia. But fourthly, we explain that you're not entitled to the benefit of other people's labour, so someone leaving your country to have a better life somewhere else isn't a meaningful harm that you can account for in that particular instance. But fifthly, we point out that by this logic, every migrant 
migrant they accept is also a harm because they're a person who could have done some job in that country and had some benefit to the economy of that country. They don't distinguish the idea of skilled labor from unskilled labor. Sixthly, we point out, oh, as I've already said, it concedes a huge benefit. And finally, I just want to say that like the context in which this, uh, uh, like in which brain drain is actually a meaningful problem for countries is almost always a context where it is a good thing for the world. For example, the fact that Russia has experienced massive brain drain in the aftermath of Vladimir Putin's war on Ukraine is good because it limits the capacity of that country to wage a war and commit war crimes in other states. It is good when people flee from regimes that are so vanishingly evil that they are unable to engage in those practices anymore. It's not like every country in the world was suffering brain drain. It was often acute failures of regimes. And we say, if anything, this creates an incentive for those regimes to cut back on their behavior because they risk losing the capacity to be able to exist as states. Finally, their own material on remittances literally rebuts their own stuff here, because if you believe that people who come here can send remittances back and it's such a big benefit for their own country, the professionals coming to Australia is good because they send remittances back home that more than outdoes the benefit of them not working there because of the exchange rates, as Eugene so handily explains to you at second. Finally, if you don't believe any of that, we just point out that states have a set of countervailing obligations to, for example, prioritize their own citizens, to look out for the good of people who already live here, which should just count away this principle. So, unclear this obligation even exists, and if that's the case, this team already just loses the debate because they rely on it so much. But, two other responses. The second one's just to say that it's unclear if the principle does exist, that they actually discharge it in any meaningful way. Because, if they actually believe the principle, they would go out and pick the most oppressed and directly affected people by Australia. Instead, they use a lottery system, which maybe helps some people whose this principle of colonialism meaningly applies to. And secondly, it's contingent on proving they do benefit those people, which we contest and they're unable to screw by the end of the debate. Lastly, though, we also point out that we also discharge this principle in a number of ways. Firstly, because we take many refugees and migrants who might be disprivileged or have been affected by Australia. Two, because we provide things like foreign aid, and Sophie gives you a lot of analysis as to why that's likely to increase and be more effective on our side. And thirdly, because of things like charity and remittances from people who come here and can now contribute back to their home economy, and Eugene does the legwork to explain to you why this is a key benefit. So, even if you believe the principle exists, and they discharge it, it's very likely we discharge it to a very similar level as well, and this cannot get this team up in the debate. What is the impact of this? It means that all of the material we give you as to why we help more migrants, why each migrant is helped more on our side, and why we get more migrants, immediately just wins this debate by a huge margin. Because without the principle, they have no weighing mechanism to explain why their very limited harms should come over the top of everything we tell you. Second issue in the debate, let's talk about migrants, noting that this argument matters for two reasons. The first is, if we can prove to you that the migrants that they take in are harmed by their move to Australia, their own principle explains why they must lose, because we have an obligation to them and they make their lives worse. But secondly, even if we are unable to do that, if we can just explain that comparatively, the people who we take in benefit more than the people they take in, on a practical utilitarian scale, you ought to weigh our argument more highly here. Why is that likely to be the case? We explain there's a huge number of costs to migrants when they move to Australia. You lose your family, you lose your culture, you lose familiar sights, sounds, nature, etc. And that means that you need to have benefits that actually overwhelm those particular costs, and that's unlikely to accrue for the people who come in under the lottery system. Why? Because we point out, firstly, Australia is a very expensive country to live in. If you aren't able to generate a sufficient amount of income, then your life is likely to be incredibly poor. Secondly, because a lack of language proficiency means that your opportunities are limited, and you're more likely to be like the victim of things like scams or illegal forms of work or exploitation in other forms. But finally, the lack of family support or community means that it's very hard to succeed and thrive in this country. Their response to this is firstly to say, well, we can just send them to Cabramatta, there's lots of ethnic people there, as if that just formed a community. Like, you actually have to have people who are somewhat related to you in that particular instance. And we explain you're very likely to be the victim of things like racism and stigma. Their final response is to say, well, obviously the migrants would make an educated choice having weighed all the options. One, why would they have the information to make this choice? Two, why would there not be an optimism bias where they believe things would be better than they are in Australia? And three, why is it not the likelihood that people who exploit these migrants would sell them the stories that tell them it would be good when it is, in fact, not good for them? If you believe this person might struggle to get a job, might be dislocated to a random town in the Atacama Desert, as this team suggests, is where they would go, or that they might be the victim of racism or exploitation, then they're very much likely to have a worse life than they would if they had just stayed, and their own principle loses them the debate. They last Hail Marys to say, well, we can teach them language skills and help them, but we explain the political capital necessary to do this vanishes on their side because of the unpopularity of their policy. They never explain why these things occur. Contrast that to our side, where we explicitly pick people who fill skill gaps within the economy, who have the skills to succeed, who have the language and the, and the familial background and the support system 
systems that mean they will immediately begin thriving, it's clear that while they activate the huge harm, we are able to claim a substantial benefit here. Why is this important? Even if the people on our side are not as vulnerable as the people they help, on a utilitarian metric, we do more good. But secondly, we think it's quite distasteful to be weighing the various oppression of different groups of migrants who might notably all have suffered distinct and meaningful forms of oppression. We probably should not weigh like the relative importance we amount accrue to those various forms of oppression. We should just use the utilitarian metric here. Finally, let's talk about why this is good for Australia. This argument mattered for two reasons. Firstly, you should care about it because we explained that if we are able to benefit Australia and give, for example, an Indigenous student a teacher or a disabled person a disability worker, that was a benefit that was meaningful in this debate. But secondly, because it also explained why we had the political will to just get more migrants, which means even if you believe they help each individual migrant war, we just get so many more of them that we outweigh them on a consideration of scale once more. Why do we help these people? Or why do these people help Australia far more? We explained because they fill skill gaps, they have similar culture, they easily integrate all the analysis we've given before and that doesn't get rebutted. They have a couple of responses as to why this won't increase political will. They say, well, the people on their side are sympathetic and not competing for jobs. Think about who it is that's upset and xenophobic. It's the average UKIP voter, it's the average One Nation voter, someone who's low ACS and works a blue collar job. The doctor is someone who benefits them, a low skilled worker is someone who competes for their labor. On our side, we align self interest and benefited them and got them interested in migration. On their side, they never could. We take this debate incredibly clearly. <laughs> the story of this debate is one where the affirmative team is constantly fighting uphill, and in doing so, they often tangle their footing. Because often, within the same speech, they contradict themselves. They say, the brain drain is bad, but remittance is the core form of in-situ aid. They say, accountants are scared for their jobs, but racism and changes in the long term are marginal. And I think these contradictions point to the heart of their case, which is that vulnerability should be number one, but we're going to use a random system. I'll do two things in this reply. The first thing I'll do is deal with their primary avenue to victory, which is to discuss vulnerability. And secondly, I'll explain why, even if you're not convinced on that metric, we come above in two key ways. Firstly, on vulnerability, this is where they hang their hat, because this is where their principle is activated, this is where all of their you know, bluster and grandstanding about the evils of Australia are activated. If you do not believe this, the majority of their material falls out. We have two ways to defeat this piece of analysis. The first thing we do is directly compare the point system and the lottery system, and we explain four key things. The first is that the vast amount of their analysis is a factual. Ask yourself, does Australia have a shortage of accountants and FIFO miners? So does it seem likely that those are the skills we're selecting for? We say no. Of course, a number of the people we want are doctors or teachers, but a number of other people are labourers or have particular skills which Australians don't want to train in. That points already to the fact that if the comparative is vulnerability, uh, sorry, is a random system, it's unclear how far behind we are on vulnerability. But secondly, we point out that we actually need to help the people we claim are vulnerable in order to claim a benefit. And their last chance to prove that they actually help these people comes at third. When they basically say, of course it's better here, and the cookie cutter consent material to say it's a rational decision. But importantly, listen to what they actually say. At no point do they connect Australia's like leading ESL education program to the willingness of the government to extend that to refugees to the ability, oh sorry, to migrants, to the ability of migrants to access those services or the re receipt of that education and training actually translating to economic outcomes. And notably, their own picture of what happens at various times is extremely grim. Some of their versions of the benefit are shipping off recently arrived migrants to half-built towns to assist in that effort as a randomly selected person from the world. Very unclear what benefit actually accrues. They may be vulnerable, but side affirmative doesn't help them. But even if you don't believe any of that material, we provide two additional ways to feed this analysis directly. We outweigh this by saying that we help more per person. So even if you believe each person the affirmative team helps is more important, we help each person we help much more for all of the reasons we explained at first. We make sure they have a support network, we make sure they have a job, we make sure they have the ability to engage with the government. And finally, and potentially most crucially, we point out that this side has to avoid harm 
before they could worry themselves proving a benefit. We explain that these people give up their home, they give up their culture, and in many cases arrive directly in a situation of exploitation, where third party agencies take a fee, convince them of a dream, and then take them for all that they have. But even if you don't believe all of that, we explain that we win in the long run. That is, we get more migrants, even if you don't think our migrants are more important. We dismiss the most destructive forms of racism by demonstrating in the medium run that these people are actually productive and helpful. We point out that much of their analysis is circular. If the people who control the system at the moment uh, aren't benefited by it, it's unclear exactly why the system operates in the way it does. And if you care about fulfilling a moral obligation, you should care about doing it as much as you can following the footsteps of Australia and Canada, not the US and UK. And even if you aren't convinced of any of that, we have alternative pathways to win the debate. We flip the brain drain argument using Eugene's handy analysis, explaining that remittance is often a benefit. We point to the benefit to Australians who now have additional service providers, who now have a stronger economy, who now have a larger workforce to draw upon. And if you're at all confused, I would say the vulnerable people of Australia are an entirely sensible stakeholder to decide the debate on. The affirmative team has been fighting uphill for a long time. They often tangle their footing. The main thing you need to remember is if you care about vulnerability, you should vote with side opposition. The opposition knows that we have a moral obligation to this people. That's why Sophie got up there and said, we should just give these countries a set foreign aid that is only legitimate because of that moral responsibility. The problem is, is that I gave specific reasons as to why that was an inappropriate form of reparations for the specific harm that was done in this case. Because I celebrate that Australia has at long last recognised the intense brain drain that occurred in the Pacific Islands. It listened to a number of Pacific Island leaders' demands that we stop a series of immigration processes that continue to exacerbate that harm. And Australia shifted to a random lottery system for those Pacific Island nations. We owe that same obligation to a number of different countries that we have done such significant harm to. And we ought to do the same to not deny the very poor citizens in developing nations where we have caused their poverty directly in the first place by taking their talent and then proceeded to deny those citizens a chance for a better life in Australia. Australia owes those citizens a slip in the hat if, if that's the least it could give to a series of individuals it has done wrong to and it has caused harm. But even if you didn't believe that, I think Australia just has an obligation more broadly to take on more immigration on humanitarian grounds. Both of us agree that Australia's refugee policy was deeply regrettable and it is politically unviable for Australia to take on refugees. The question then is, how best should Australia fulfil its moral obligation to take on more immigrants on humanitarian grounds? And we say that this is the best possible way to fulfil that. Because we explain, Australia specifically has failed a series of international obligations to share the burdens of immigration, to alleviate the individuals that do want to leave their country because they do not feel that they are having the best opportunities of their life there. And to the extent that Australia wrongfully abused its border control, it should not do that again. It should err on the side of caution to keep those borders open. And what are the three Hail Marys side opposition prove tries to do to claw back any ground against this enormous moral obligation? The first is explaining that this is bad for the migrants themselves. And I'm going to urge a hell of a lot of caution of this argument if you believe it. Because we were so wrong to prevent a number of migrants going into Australia for their own good that we should really err on the side of caution to respect the legitimate consent of a number of migrants unless given overwhelming proof that they did not consent to make that decision. Mandela explained to you that consent was very easy to prove in this instance because these individuals make this decision all the time. They are working abroad on a daily basis and yes that is despite the enormous amount of optimism that they have that that seasonal work in Thailand is going to give them a better life. The misinformation that they received like what is the misinformation even doing like lying to them that they won't have to leave their family behind it's just bizarre and we think that people have spent a large amount of time in what is a very serious decision we all respect that decision but we think overwhelmingly that decision is a good one because in the same way that our Pacific Islander lottery system works by providing a large amount of support to those Pacific Islanders that it randomly acquires, it provides them free TAFE courses, it provides them subsidised housing, it provides them 
them a great degree of support in choosing where they want to be. Australia uniquely is a country with a diaspora to support those individuals that uniquely embases multiculturalism in a way that makes the type of racist slurs and harassment quite improbable. Sophie points out that there is a lot of symmetry. The biggest question of the <coughs> debate is who do we provide this support to? We think we owe this support to the individuals who are the most vulnerable and who have been barred into Australia historically. Their last Hail Mary is like, ah, but there'll be less migrants in the first place. The problem is that this is just so marginal. Like, who are you convincing here? The potential economists that are rationally weighing up their economic benefit. We think that people support immigration because of their genuine feelings on the ground. You're never going to persuade a set of racists or xenophobes. And as such, even if the number of immigrants is slightly lower, which I think is quite plausible, disproportionately our immigrants are so much more likely to be disprivileged. I mean, it is fair that there was a significant lottery of birth, and the only correct way to repay that is a lottery of re-entry of immigration. That is why we're proud to propose.